Welcome to Party Chat Peoples. We have been on hiatus for a good while, figuring out, you know, what we want to talk about and also living our best lives. But today we are here to talk about what exactly, Stacey? <laughs> We're going to run through some video games that have been interesting and impactful lately. Uh, despite all this, or even perhaps because of all this with the pandemic and with it coming to somewhat of a close, though vaccinations are still ongoing at this time. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about It Takes Two, which is a video game where two players cooperate in person uh, to achieve shared goals. While to save their relationship. To save the relationship <laughs> of the two main characters who are on the verge of, of divorce. Um, then we may take a side stop with Killer Queen, which is a competitive game uh, that, that requires a little explanation, which we, which we will give you. Um, then I'm gonna talk about Returnal, which is a first person shooter with a sort of bullet hell style and a very strong conspiracy theory uh, <laughs> underlying it that uh, we're gonna give you full on spoilers for the super secret second ending to the game. And finally, we're going to talk about No Man's Sky and their latest expedition, which was called which is, Beachhead. Which is somehow just still doing stuff for free. Like, booted it up on a PS5 with the update recently, and it's just like, right. that took a lot of work. Why aren't they charging me for it? And, and how did they get the other company to also not charge anything for it? <laughs> <laughs> so it Indeed. is an homage to another video game, and we'll explain that. But back to It Takes Two, we've got some special guests here who've been playing the game themselves. How would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Uh, sure, thanks. Uh, we're honored to be here. This is, a, this is really fun. Um, my name's Nicole. Uh, I am, I come from education, um, from teaching pre-K, and then I started, um, doing operations for an after-school company and lost my job at the start of the pandemic and decided to go to grad school and got into the Games for Learning uh, program at NYU Steinhardt, um, which was a whirlwind of applying, making the, the extended deadline because of the pandemic. Found out I got in in two weeks, started two weeks later. So it was just really wonderful. Um, and this is my partner, Alex. Uh, hi, my name is Alex. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a very casual uh, video gamer, barely a video gamer at all, but um, a, a, a tabletop gamer, a D&D &D player, and all that happy stuff, um, <laughs> and a filmmaker by trade. Nice. So how did you guys decide to get started with It Takes Two? Why did that one resonate with you, too? That's a question. That is a new question. Um, so, you know, we were looking for, uh, it was actually kind of spontaneous. Um, I mean, we, we do a lot of games together, um, whether it's code names, uh, what else? Uh, he's, he has purchased uh, a lot of fun tabletop games for us. Uh, we do a lot of crosswords um, and we have a, a mutual love of film. So we watch a lot of movies. Um, but we'd been watching a lot of movies lately and I play a lot of like first person shooters and a lot of video games. I'm more of a video gamer than a tabletopper. Um, we have a Venn diagram crossover there, but, um, wanted to do something less passive, wanted to do something a little more active. Um, you know, like a lot of couples during the pandemic, we've struggled with our communication, struggled with both losing our jobs at the same time. And, um, I wanted to specifically find something that was really cooperative. The first game that came to mind was Portal, um, it, which is very physics heavy and mm -hmm. he is quite a fan of physics. Um, but in my research, uh, my rudimentary research online, it takes two popped up on a couple lists. And so uh, I went down the rabbit hole and people just raved about it, whether it was couples uh, such as ourselves or I, saw a really cute review from a dad saying him and his daughter were playing and it was like the most fun family co-op they'd ever had and Aww. I was like I I didn't even know what the narrative was I didn't even go like that deep dive 
So it was a fun surprise uh, when the cinematic opening came up and I was like, oh, wow, this is specifically about a couple on the brink of collapse. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, wow, they read, they read my number. I'm, yeah. like, they, I'm like, down my diary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this so game is I, mind reading us. Right. So I'm going <laughs> to share my screen for just a second so that I can show the trailer for the game. And for just a second, I'm going to have the audio on because I want you guys to see, this is Dr. Hakeem and his book of love. Uh, and he is, he is quite a character and I kind of want to discuss him a little bit more, but also this is going to give people a little bit of an idea of what the game is about. Do you want to know what this story is really about? Huh? This is the story of Cody ah! Ah! and me. <laughs> Why do you look like a blob of clay? Wanna change back? Then you need to fix your relationship. Okay, so <laughs> that's enough for you to understand what is what is happening here. They've been turned into tiny dolls, and if they would like to be human beings again, uh, they have to go through a whole series of trials together. And you control these these characters during the game. Yeah, and and I thought it was interesting to see. Uh, this narrative after the previous game by Hazelight was a way out, which uh, was like more like bank heisty kind of co-op game. Yeah, it's a prison uh, breakout game by two people who didn't previously know each other, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So instead, it's it's it makes a lot of sense that the sort of rough scaffolding of doing the split screen, one player controls each character, they have to obviously work together, uh, would work well in this more uh, family oriented context kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it was a good shift in like tone and, and narrative, um, but still stays true to like their niche, I guess. So that's yeah. pretty, pretty good. And I, I think it's important to know that this is headed up by someone who really wanted to be a movie director, right? So you can see the kind of cinematic style, the creative camera angles they use, not just during the cutscenes, but during the actual gameplay, the way everything is very visually imaginative, more so than you might see with some other video games. But it also yeah, does some good camera work to make sure that you have like the context you need during some of the more cinematic parts of the, of the game, I would say, too. Yeah, it's, it's really narrative forward um, and, and I'd say downright emotionally manipulative. <laughs> <laughs> that's arguably true. And, and That's not arguable at all. <laughs> There's a little girl crying because her parents are getting divorced and you have to, you know, save this, this situation. Those are her dolls. They, <laughs> the, the parents become manifest of her actual dolls. That her she... literal tears turn you into a fucking doll. Like, come on. I was right, right. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so, I love so, you know, those several moments. If you don't finish the game, it's fine, but that little child will be crying forever, right? Yeah, yeah that's absolutely implied. <laughs> Not the world end parts. because of, the, of an asteroid or whatever, but... Right, you know, yeah. little girl's life is just horrible from that on. But I do it love is. how imaginative it gets. I know you guys uh, have gotten as far as I think the first like big boss fight. Is that right? The vacuum cleaner? No, we got to the second boss. We 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 cool struggled box. to defeat the yeah. second boss, and then and then have taken a couple of days off since then. It it was so yeah. late, and we were so brain dead by that point. We were like, <laughs> well, this would be such a great milestone to end on. We'll we'll try to defeat this boss and. Because it has that, um, especially what we talk about in game design, um, it's like pleasurable frustration. Uh, uh -huh. But we were so tired. We're like, this is, we're, it's dwindling the pleasurable portion of it. So we let's leave with a good taste in our mouth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I gotta yeah. say that mirrors me and Stacy had quite a few times where we were like really enjoying the game, but we'd been at it for hours and it was just like, this game is meatier than we thought. Like we got to put right. it down and come I'd back to it. I'd be honest. Later. I was expecting a maybe five hour game, right? With, yeah. with three or four boss fights and a bunch of interesting levels where you, where you run around their house and their, their garden, their outside uh, from the perspective of being little tiny people. So like <laughs> I, I, honey, I shrunk the kids. That's what right? I think of. 
yeah. <laughs> in video game form. And uh, it was what more like a 10 to 15 hour game, depending on how much you... Is that you how know, long you guys clocked on it, 15? <sighs> I'm not sure offhand, but it's in that ballpark. It might have yeah. been, yeah, it might have hit 20. I don't know. But right. so keep in mind there are a bunch of these little mini games along the way, and you can either ignore them entirely, uh, play them once to see how they work and to have a an official winner of, of each game, or you could just get obsessed and compete against each other for hours. I was going to say, if you have want. ADHD and are on the spectrum like me, you'll make <laughs> Alex play the whack-a-mole game over and over and over again. <laughs> that had less to do with ADHD and more to do with the fact that she didn't win. I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> All you have to do is not not hit anything and she'll, she'll win. That's so there, there, there you go. I'm solving your problem for you. But yeah, it does remind me a little bit of Mario Party. Uh, some of these games are based on things you would have heard about in real life. Like I got super obsessed with one that's kind of like hurling uh, towards the end of the game. And that's there's cool. whack-a-mole, there's a version of chess. So some of these are kind of familiar and some of these are just weird and wacky. You know? <laughs> but it, but and I think it's, real oh, sorry. No, I was right. just gonna say, I think it's interesting how they have those be these little side things where you can like in in that, in that very obvious voluntary context, you can explicitly compete with each other. Yeah. And the voice lines and everything kind of help to make it feel not too like like in each other's face about it because mm -hmm. like you're mirroring these characters that obviously need to work on their shit. So, <laughs> so like you'll be, you, you know, whoever will win will like brag about it. And it, it almost kind of keys me back into like, okay, but let's not be braggarts like IRL and like reintroduce the same shit that they have going on into, into right. our thing. So it's a, it's a really interesting context, I think, for like explicit competition within an otherwise fully co-op game. That's exactly what, um, what I was, I was going to say. I think it's really interesting from a psychological perspective um, to have these kind of antagonistic, I mean, again, we've only done the whack-a-mole, which, but that one is explicitly antagonistic. Mm -hmm. that it like almost releases the pressure cooker of if you're getting frustrated you're working with another person it kind of you blow off the steam in this really mm -hmm. fun competitive mm -hmm. context and i think it helps you keep going yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. makes sense i, I think, think my I favorite think designing was designing some some kind of a punching bag <laughs> uh, uh frustration uh vent mechanism into the game was absolutely intended the second i think the first like like big kind of of power up you get in the game is like i got to shoot some nails and she got like the head of a claw hammer and of course the first thing she did when she got the head of the claw hammer was like keep fucking whacking me with it <laughs> yeah, but, um... oh boy of course and you could have shot nails at and her, our so. our couples uh, uh constantly can determine what that really means a know? relationship <laughs> coach <laughs> right yeah you mean later Dr. <laughs> yeah oh yeah Carrie's very lovely i have yes. yeah um last out to carry sackett I think my favorite amongst those kind of games was actually one where you throw snowballs at each other. You're like literally <laughs> whacking each other in a non non painful but annoying <laughs> fashion. Uh, and right. yeah, I think you're right. It does. It also kind of breaks up the story, so it's not constant uh, breakneck speed because a lot of the in between se sequences has you have you being chased by someone or uh, you might be carried along swiftly by water, so it feels like a rapids ride, or you're And the flying. characters are constantly screaming about how terrifying everything is. <laughs> right, so having these quieter moments uh, in which you can choose to play these games if you want to blow off some steam was pretty smart on their part. Yeah, I think. and it's very railroady otherwise. Yeah. Right, but I do think though that, um, Alex, you were talking earlier about how their design for, for co-op games does nail one thing in particular that I think is super important for yeah. any kind of co-op thing, which is like, it forces you to really talk to each other. Um, there's ways in which if you have the claw hammer, like you start seeing the level a certain way. And if you have the nail gun, you start seeing the level a certain way. And it just, you, you have to like mesh those, you have to combine those perspectives to, to make progression in certain parts in a way that I think they got really good at through both of the games they've done. And 
yeah, you you were the one who brought it up. I, like, I think that's you're you're dead on about that. Yeah, there's so much stuff in that game where, I mean, literally, I don't see how you could accomplish it without being in the same room as somebody else and literally saying, okay, we're going on three, one, two, three, and and jump or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Um, it's it just doesn't seem uh, possible to me. Um, and right, and you have to combine those perspectives to do this consummate problem solving um like I, I don't think there was maybe more than like a 60 second period or a 90 second period in the game where you can kind of run ahead of the other person or do your own thing and aren't forced to to reconvene and, and do some some coordination because there's only so much mm -hmm. so far as you can go without without your your respective yeah. partner. partner right and yep. later on without getting like too spoilerific they they do a good job of upping the challenge partly by like physically yeah. separating you sometimes and making it so it's like oh you have to do the thing and it's like i can't see the thing what are you talking about and it right yeah. becomes yeah you have yeah, to talk to each other they, through what they need to do and yeah. they also make an interesting point about how uh attraction can partly be based on absence so here's an interesting point for people who've been forced to quarantine together during the <laughs> pandemic and have found it uncomfortable <laughs> uh it Fair actually warning. yeah it it actually helps to not be around your partner all the time so you have an opportunity to miss them uh oh, so and that's it, that's, <laughs> it does help it does help uh and they also talk alex says before he walks away before, <laughs> um, <laughs> hot. That's a good one. Now, exactly and they also talk about how um pursuing other interests that aren't about your job or your partner can make you more attractive to them um yeah. and that's super that real was, and very something we all need to think about during the pandemic too that was one of my favorite parts about where the narrative goes but again without ruining anything for you guys i i do like that it doesn't um feel as though this is just like uh all about the romance and how do you like like in some moments hakeem dr hakeem totally just you know the book of love just totally feels like a caricature who doesn't know what he's talking about and like isn't being helpful at all but there's you know genuine moments do come through where they learn things about each other in terms of stuff that has nothing to do with their relationship more to do with what their life is like outside of it and little ways in which they've changed or they've they've sacrificed things that that they might regret and and that was i think when it started to feel like these are uh real characters who actually have something to teach as in, like rather than just like a really cool hook to do a co-op experience so you guys will get there i don't i don't think you've seen too much of what i'm alluding to there yeah. um but i do think yeah it's it's uh it it's well it's well done in that regard they they yeah. start to feel less gimmicky as right. less and yeah. less as time goes on yeah and dr hakeem feels more like he knows what he's talking about he's just not he wants you to experience it rather than just telling things to you which is nice um i do want to take just a second to talk about i always like to talk about representation of video games so i, one, I remember you mentioning i was just it, thinking yeah. this about the woman she's a female scientist which right, is, or right. so so first really quickly about dr hakeem so that's like an arabic last name but he's totally voiced as some kind of Spanish speaking dude. Uh, I don't know how the direction on that went, but the voice actor is actually really good. I can't, I can't fault it. It's funny. I um, love it. <laughs> I, it was, yeah. he, he has, he has like an air of, I, the way you put it, Stacey was folky. His voice sounds very folky and like, like someone who like happens to have gone to college and got a doctorate, but like, still like up in a comes to their town. hometown and this is how we talk and like that kind yeah, of thing yeah, yeah. and uh as opposed to like they could have gone for a more like dry like I, oh i'm the love doctor and oh like <laughs> or they, like or they could have gone thing. with a, a snooty french accent and had him be somebody <laughs> who kind of like looks right. down on the couple <laughs> as idiots for not being able to solve their problems instead <laughs> he's just like this kind of don't worry, you'll figure it out. He's very optimistic. Yeah. In some ways, them. he feels like a weird uncle who's like trying to be supportive, but like he feels like he's saying the most cliched things. And then he, then like you said, he, there are moments where it's just like, damn it, this guy has a point. 
Like he's yeah. not he's not talking he's out of his impish head. too. He's got that Loki impishness. Like he's toying with them, but like helping them find the the playful path in life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then on, on Cody's side, you've got the, you know, stay-at-home dad who loves his gardening and, like, is a, is a little bit getting, like, thicker in the, in the body. And, and a little, I, I can't remember a little which sensitive character. about it a little bit. Yeah, which, I can't remember which character, like, goats him about that, if you guys have seen that yet, but... <laughs> about but a dad bod? We might have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally but fun. he's also, like super supportive of his <clears throat> wife to the point of being a little bit in awe of her and i don't think that comes out until well into the game because they spend so much time arguing with each other it's like that part of their relationship just kind of got lost there's you know? foreshadowing yeah. in the writing i feel like though there's those you get these glimpses and these glimmers which is i think very true to life you know when when you're in crisis or you're stressed out or in conflict rather mm -hmm. you know you don't always see and remember why exactly you're here to begin with and they, there's glimmers in the writing between them that i caught then it makes sense what you're alluding to right and and did you want to talk about uh the lady as well and you know oh how yeah she feels? um for representation yes yeah. uh i mean as a as a, a woman in stem um it was really nice to see oh well the, the mom's the engineer you know they they did go against I mean, type, that's usually how women are portrayed in a lot of video games. Um, obviously the tides are turning, things are changing, um, but it was really refreshing to have the stay-at-home dad, the, the mom engineer. And um, yeah, I, it just makes my, my little heart happy. Mm -hmm. yeah, she yeah. owns all the power tools in the, yeah. in the first chapter. Right, and, and when they talk about how their little kid had a thing about space, uh, again, they're giving a little girl an interest in space as kind of a science-y subject and mm -hmm. talking about how, how her mom was very supportive and knew things about that more than, than her dad did. So it does feel like they they did essentially a gender swap, which in some ways is kind of smart. If the couple does the thing that most people are going to gravitate to and the guy plays the dude and the girl plays the, the lady, they will be forced to empathize with the other traditional genders point of view because she is the one who works too much yeah I and think that's exactly feels it. some regret about that and and he is the one who struggles to feel like a good parent you know more more than the other and mm -hmm. so by kind of embodying that person you're kind of forced to see the perspective of someone who feels that way and even with the abilities yeah. that they give them throughout the game, I feel like with, um, cause we switched uh, like almost every time that we played, like which, which yeah. roles we were. And mm -hmm. I do feel like they give Cody the more like classic, like support role type tools and, mm -hmm. and like, <laughs> and, and then the, the wife is like there with the claw hammer just being stuff. <laughs> So yes. yeah, it's it was very good for on on that front as well, and I think you you have the logic exactly right. If you, I think they were they were thinking in those terms. Like if people just go for their respective gender in their relationship, then statistically speaking, the chances are high that they will have they will be forced to like empathize with the opposite role that they might be accustomed to, or at least stereotypically used to. So that, that basically covered the things I most wanted to discuss on this. Um, Alex, you were saying that this game reminded you of, of a, a super different game um, yeah. called Killer Queen. So it's an arcade competitive game. And while we yeah. talk about it, I'm going to show a little bit of video from it. But why does, it, why does that feel similar to you? They're very, very different. Well, like I said, I am not much of a, of a video gamer, but something that I really uh, like and think is, is really successful in, in both these two games is they force real world communication, like absolutely force it. Um, you know, in, in It Takes Two, like I said, you literally have to just count down and do this thing at the same time. And you really have to be in the same room to do that. Um, in Killer Queen, at least the, the, the sort of cabinet arcade version, you know, it comes as two cabinets um both accommodate five players that that play slightly different uh, can play slightly different roles um and you're meant to coordinate um uh, against one another uh, a team of five on a team of five 
Um, Three ways to victory. And really to be any good at it, you really have to be communicating all the time. Um, you know, without going way too into the specific mechanics of the game, you can see there's like these little wings on the screen. Um, those are called gates uh, or warrior gates in this case. Um, and like, you know, if I'm stuck and I want to become a warrior in this game, you know, I have to yell at whoever's playing the queen for my team or is the leader of my team. Hey, I need a gate. Um, and they have to, you know, shout out, okay, left gate or right gate or whichever one they, they've managed to open up for me. Um, and, you know, um, there's, there's multiple things, there's multiple ways to win a game of Killer Queen. Um, your team can either fill your hive with berries, you can get the snail at the bottom of the screen to your goal, or you can kill the opposing queen three times, which is really too much for one single player uh, to keep an eye on. Um, mm. but it's kind of important in the game for people to be shouting out, oh, snail. you know. <laughs> right, right. We have an advantage on, on snail. We're making good snail progress or the other team has one berry to go. And all of a sudden, you know, some of the other team might fly up there and start, start playing defense, defense yeah. um, or whatever it is. And, you know, I'm not a super advanced player. This game has a a really, 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 really dedicated and really competitive uh, a subculture. Um, I've been told that there's only four of these machines in, in New York City. One of them, I think, is at an arcade called something like Water Wonderland or something in, in Bushwick. One is at in Queens Brewery uh, in Ridgewood. One is on the NYU campus somewhere, and one is at a Google office of some kind. Um, sounds, and people just flock out. down the street uh, uh, to, to Queens Brewery on Friday nights, um, you know, sometimes 10 deep, sometimes 20 deep, sometimes 30 deep, just to to, to play this game with one another and, and practice it in preparation for, like, the serious tournament, <laughs> tournament play. Yeah, uh, I, I got to say, there's something wild to me about coming out of the pandemic and feeling like okay finally i'm gonna go to a bar this feels so weird i have been cooped up for a long time and then seeing like 20 people crowded around a couple of arcade cabinets yeah and it just like <laughs> is it the 80s what's happening what's, right <laughs> yeah it's like i i don't know what's going you've got on the hand bar. fanny right there though and that that's a remarkable thing about it, it is 80s like because it's it's yeah, really yeah. like the, the architecture of the game is not high tech at all it's two-dimensional it's like looks like super nintendo graphics um it's the static playing field that I mean, doesn't it's scroll at all at its it's, it's um <laughs> um you know so it really is just about uh, like simple mechanical gameplay. You only get a button and one button and a joystick, um, yeah. and and mastering that that simple mechanical uh, gameplay, and then it leaves a lot of space for getting good at it means coordinating with your team, mm -hmm. um, and at a really high level, like everybody's just constantly chatting about what the hell's going on um, in the game and trying to communicate with one another. Very that cool. That makes sense. Now I get yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, you guys, um, you guys could dedicate a whole episode to this game. It's, it's got a lot. It's really fun. It's like <laughs> Ten minutes to learn. Um, you know, I, I've been playing for a, a, a while. I'm nowhere near uh, uh, mastering it, uh, which you know is often the sign of a, of a good, good game. But yeah, um, yeah, come on down to Queens Brewery or find a, a a cabinet somewhere in the city and and play if you have, or somewhere else in the country and, and play if you have a chance. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah. Stay out of our, out of our Brewery, gaming at least. Community. Friday night. Our, Friday night. Sorry. Go I was just gonna say David Z is is our our queen usually and ah <laughs> yes that explains why he he came by at the start of the night and says like are you gonna play because yeah. you you become the effective organizer of sort as the queen <laughs> yeah yeah I think I think he was checking to see if if he needs to work me into the team or what's the deal you yeah. know and I think generally that the subculture around that game is really good about fostering. Uh, uh, inclusion, they like teaching the game, they like talking about the game, and even though there's this huge, huge, huge disparity in skill level, right, the people that are really good at that game, I, I think, tend to to not kind of talk shit and whatever, they, they, they really mm -hmm. try to include people, try to teach, um, and and foster uh, other people's enthusiasm or, or beginners enthusiasm. Especially at a team size of five, like, it, I don't yeah. care how good you are at the game, if you're not taking people under your wing and explaining stuff, Mm -hmm. you're you're just yeah, shooting yourself in the foot right exactly right. That. yeah and it it feels like in that way um it reminds me of the community of uh regular arcade fighting games back in the day yeah. where you know street fighter 2 was being like the original like that you would have kids teaching each other how to play and kind of going easy 
on the little players who are still learning yep. and then being totally rough on each other when they find somebody at their own skill level. Yeah, yeah. How come, how come you say that now, but you're always, you always claim that I'm being mean when I take it easy <laughs> on someone in fantasy strike. And then like for the last round, I just like beat them and I'm Destroy just like, them. they need to learn. <laughs> <laughs> It feels like a cat toying with a mouse, occasionally, what you do. It's like, you're not quite dead yet. I see you have a sliver of health left. I'm just going to stand here for a while and let you beat me. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Now I shall do it. Very M. Bison, just sitting there going. Yeah. In pedagogical terms, we do call that the zone of proximal development. Um, oh, yeah. Well, I got gotta... Scaffolding you in a really tough love kind of way. <laughs> If I can remember all those words in sequence, I'm going to use them next time she makes me feel bad. <laughs> Good. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready for that. <laughs> so, uh, in, in any case, for me, this is why I wanted to have you guys on the podcast. I know you'd have something uh, interesting to say that we otherwise wouldn't uh, get across. And I was right. So, I really, yeah. really Thank appreciate you so much for having us. us. Yeah. Indeed, this has been lovely. Yeah. All right, so is there anything else you guys want to talk about? Uh, otherwise, we're going to continue with the rest of the podcast on our own. No, I'm going to go torture him and make him eat the falafel spring rolls I ordered no, him but that he's already upset about. You know, <laughs> give us, yeah, right. Um, you know, yeah, give me a shot if you find uh, more games that that do this thing of, of, of fostering um, real mm. in, in uh, uh, cooperation. Like, well, when you, know, you guys. A splash screen that literally says, meet thy neighbors. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, it was yeah. really just designed for that i think that's a really cool idea and, and trend and i hope it it really well expands. when when you guys wrap up it takes two the easiest thing to tell you guys because it'll be designed similarly is to go back to their previous game a way out and you'll have a nice right. little heist crime story that you can go through together that's fun i'm into that yeah and i would say that skill level wise that is the easier of the two to master by a good bit gotcha mm -hmm. good to know all Thank right. Thank you so much. Indeed. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Okay. Take care. Have a lovely Enjoy your food. Sunday. 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 Have yeah, a lovely Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. See you guys soon. And then there were two. And then there were two. And two more games to discuss. We have uh, Returnal and No Man's Sky. I kind of want to do No Man's Sky first because it's going to be relatively short and easy. Yeah. 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 I agree. It's. Uh, it's a somewhat known quantity, but still shocking that they're still doing cool stuff and pulling me back into the game. And, yeah, yeah. Speaking you know, of that, and, um, and, and I guess now you've gone through at least one or two cycles of that yourself, of being in the game, taking, you know, stepping away uh -huh. for a while, but then the game still pulling you back in. <laughs> pulling me back in, doing new stuff. Uh, yeah, so I'm playing the trailer right now for the newest uh, edition called Prisms. And the goal is to really make update. It pretty. Still it's still free. <laughs> still free. So it really makes this game um, new gen console compatible. On the PlayStation now, loading times are, are so short. Yeah, uh, they've had a PS5 version out for a while, mm -hmm. um, but it didn't feel like it was really taking advantage too much. This one actually feels just remarkably like it's next gen like i booted up the game and normally it takes a minute or two to, of like the cool little uh what's the, the movie 2005 like that whole sequence going on for like a solid minute you can go like get a snack and then you come back and the game's done loading this it yeah. took like five seconds i was right stunned <laughs> yes yes and uh it is in fact quite prettier the warp effects are nicer the glowies are glowier uh, but they've, it's not just that. Now, when you're on a planet at night, you can look up and see the, the stars in the sky. Uh, you have proper daytime and nighttime on planets, which you didn't really have before. Uh, it, it used to be possible to have companions. That's an expansion from a while ago. But now you can get a flying one and use it to fly around with, which is real fun. Um, and they've made some changes to space stations that are interesting that I won't go into. But um, none of that to me has been as cool as uh, the community expedition, which, you know, this is not the first community expedition. It's, it's the second, second, I believe it was. Yeah. 
Um, it's over on. now. So unfortunately, if anyone gets super excited by what we're talking about, it's, uh, it's, it's too, too late. late for you. <laughs> so uh, here's where here's where we're getting to spoiler territory. Um, so uh, Beachhead started just like the original community expedition. You're just dropped onto a planet and you do have a ship. You do have uh, the ability to mine the materials you need to repair your ship and get off the planet. Um, but very quickly, uh, you are given goals that lead you to particular places and uh, your rewards for achieving smaller goals help you to get there. So you are being led uh, and, and many, many other players are being led to the same location ultimately, though you're taking many different paths to get there. Um, and so uh, it gets real interesting as you get towards your goal, you guys are starting everywhere in the universe and converging on this one planet. And as you get close, uh, you can start to see the players really helping each other along the way, uh, building bases on hostile planets so that you know people can survive more easily there. Or example. just see the waypoint way easier because mm -hmm. it can be a little bit tricky to like start to figure out what you're looking for early on. Right. And then the later ones were partly easier because someone went and built a big base nearby. So you'd kind of be like, well, that's it's probably near the thing that they were looking for, which is probably the thing that I'm looking for. Right. And and it even becomes a source of bragging rights of a kind for people. Once they know where their planet is, they can take their original character who's locked 200 hours on this game and has oodles of every known resource. And they can go to that planet and build a city-sized base that's just ridiculously complicated uh, to show off, right? <laughs> uh, and in, in some cases, it's just with some really cheeky stuff that happens. Uh, I found a base somebody made uh, that led you higher and higher, and it was really fun until the last uh, teleporter sends you underground to a place where you can't get out. <laughs> that was... <laughs> Jokes on you. Oh no, <laughs> that seems like something you shouldn't be allowed to do. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, you, if you give them the tools, they will grief each other. They will grief each other. Uh, yeah, so it's it's funny. At another planet I went to, somebody had renamed every single rock, plant, animal as a joke. And the amount of effort oh, they yeah. went to just to I, name things. I saw that one too. That was great. <laughs> that, like there was one that was literally that same that same damn rock but smaller it was actually like the full name something along right, those lines right. which Pebbles is just very funny yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh very cheeky very, very funny. cheeky yeah so i really enjoyed kind of seeing the input of other players and then towards the very end of the expedition it fell apart for me a little bit because uh the event on the final planet calls something into being each time somebody sets off the final event so towards the end when everybody's trying to beat the clock there are hundreds of things hovering around because and now it's hard to tell where you are or what's going on and it was really a mess i won't lie yeah it was it was a bit <laughs> confusing and like it kind of reminds me of a story of like when Lord of the Rings Online came out and they did a combination of like instanced areas and public areas, yes. but like they made the mistake of making like the scene in the movie where like, or not in the movie, but the scene in the bar, like towards the beginning of the first movie, you meet Aragorn yes. in the game Lord of the Rings Online and that was a public area. So it totally took out, like took the immersion out because instead of being in an instance where your character is talking to Aragorn and getting some kind of quest, which would feel immersive, there's just like dozens of players of people surrounding Aragorn. Aragorn and just, and it's just like, this is dumb. And yeah. it kind of has those vibes towards the end when you reach the last planet and it's just kind of like, wow, there's a lot of people around here, but it's sort of taking me out of a moment that could have felt very different. Yeah. That's and aside idea. from that, I will also say like, there were some challenges on the roadmap that weren't super well thought out in terms of like 
how doable they are. And there were one or two things that I kind of had to like work my way around the game on, which doesn't feel good. Um, but I did enjoy it enough to stay up all night, probably unhealthily, in order to get my nice shift. <laughs> And I did the same thing a couple of days before because I wanted you to have enough time to do the same thing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it took a game that was, for me, getting a little stale. Uh, and it really gave it some fresh new life. And it genuinely felt rewarding at the end. Uh, despite the little bit of glitchiness towards the very tail end of the expedition, I'm sure they will have learned from that, uh, yeah. as these developers seem to learn pretty quickly uh from the occasional faux pas um i i suspect the next ones will be even better but i will say this i did not expect uh a crossover with the mass effect universe uh beachhead is clearly now that we know a reference to the end of mass effect one which ends on vermeyer beach and has one of the most painful decisions uh, from a plot perspective i've ever had to make in a video game um, and I don't want to spoil Mass Effect, but I do want to say uh, I wouldn't have thought they would be on board with having uh, such a detailed rendering of their signature ship in a completely different video game with an expansion bit that nobody's charging for. <laughs> you just get one. Yeah, I think it was an interesting bit of cross promo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on some level, they just, I'm sure, like through the sound effects at the end through the sound effects and the like model for the ship, just like at the developers and we're just like, we obviously need to review what you do, but like, just do this and it'll up our profile kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it was, it was somewhat concerning how effective that was at making me go, I want it. I want one. <laughs> and even from a gameplay perspective, it has its advantages. The Normandy ship that you get has some permanent buffs and it never seems to need to be repaired. It's kind of magic that way. So yeah, you can just send it on like any security run, and and it's just like I annihilated everything, and everything is fine. Here's your money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I guess you're the commander of the commander now. Commander. Commander. <laughs> Shepard. We, Shepard. Yeah, we, you know, that's that's the nature of having a video game where you have uh create your own main yeah. character style. You have to So now play. that so now that we have this crossover, now we have to start theorizing about whether the Reapers are aligned with Atlas. Oh boy. Now we're what, now we're getting complicated. Now we're getting complicated. <laughs> I'm not even going to go into the whole Alice storyline, although I do, I do very much. I'm very fond of, of how they went uh, cosmic and bizarre uh, with that, with that plotline. Um, it is worth pursuing every possible ending of that game. I'll just, I'll just say that. Anyway, uh, st talking about pursuing every possible ending of a game. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> that, that brings us to our last one, Returnal. I'm not even sure why I decided I was going to play this one because I had heard that it was hard and that a single game could last hours and there was no easy way to save without losing your progress, right? Yeah, I'm kind of round. So again, it's a just to go back a second, it's a roguelike game, right? So when you die, you start back over at the beginning, but there are some things that can stay with you and certainly the plot line continues to progress from one round to the next. Anyway. Yeah, it's it's really, to me, the third person shooter modern take on what Hades did and a lot of other uh, games like Dead Cells and uh, ah, now I'm blanking on the other, eh, whatever. Um, you know, it's been a popular little genre for a while for good reason because of that, um, that challenge hook that mm -hmm. like really started getting back into fashion somewhere around a decade ago or whatever um but this one's really novel and good partly because they made a third person shooter bullet hell um right. which as far as i know I, that's not a thing that people that that i've played before and it works really good it's really really well polished gameplay wise mm -hmm. and then it's extremely 
alluring narratively. They they have yeah. interesting yeah. hooks. I will say that um, while it's not a perfect analogy, it feels a little bit like lost to me in the yeah, sense that yeah. there's a lot of allusions toward like deeper meanings and and more to learn that right. don't yeah. really pay off. Yeah, but I'm, I would I'm be showing lying a... if I said I didn't enjoy being in that hunt, you know. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm showing really quickly um, this video of the sort of bizarre thing we're talking about. You're on an alien planet, and every time you die, the features move around so that things are not where you remember them. You're fighting different enemies and different combinations, but for no apparent reason, your childhood home is in this world recreated perfectly and beautifully and from apparently different points in your life uh, as as you progress in the game it has a, books you can read voicemail messages you can hear you can enter the rooms and sometimes you become a younger version of yourself uh, and towards the end uh, it it starts to reveal more about what is what is going on with this this main character who is an astronaut yeah. named Celine? You get some more concrete bits as you move along that do snap certain things into place and you know maybe uh, negate some theories you might have as you're playing through. But uh, there's nothing quite conclusive. And I'll say that while that may lead to a little bit of lack of satisfaction, I do think it works tonally actually because mm -hmm. in some ways this can feel a game like a game about meaning and like in a cosmic horror sense the meaning of like everything like you know we're out here in the cosmos we're discovering this freaky planet what what implications does that have sort of thing and the lack of concrete answers is part of like the unsettling tone that i think right. if they yeah. if they had you know tied a bow on it it would have been a weird tonal shift in some ways not to say that it doesn't not to say that that should negate any critiques of it, mm. but um, mm. but but I like I said the vibe that's really persistent throughout it in terms of like just the unknowableness of this planet and what the hell is going on. Um, I'm okay with not personally. I'm okay with not having like had a had a bow tied on the top of that narrative and everything explained. Um, it was worth it was worth the squeeze. Right. Even if it's not yeah. like, you know, yeah. here's your here's your big final Kojima cutscene that explains everything. <laughs> right, right. So here I'm gonna go full full spoiler. If you don't want to be spoiled on the game, then don't don't keep watching this podcast. You're done. Uh, the uh, <laughs> last ten minutes or so of this video are gonna go into what happens. Um, this is after the credits roll, uh, and after you farm every habitable zone to find these random pieces that fit together into the form of a sun and you can enter the house one last time um and uh yeah i think and I you've think been like avoiding this basement like the for whole so time. much <laughs> for the whole time yeah uh and when you get there you find out why you have avoided so this as if your mind has been trying to protect you um so Relatively early in the game, you see a cutscene where uh, Celine is, you don't know if she's imagining, seeing, remembering uh, a car ride with a young girl and an older woman uh, riding along. And the little girl says, do you see the white shadow? Uh, when the older woman looks up at the road, she sees the shadow of an astronaut and in swerving to avoid uh, crashing into that figure, they actually drive off a bridge, fall into, uh, I don't know, a lake or river, and sink to the bottom. Uh, and eventually you find out that uh, the older woman sees uh, some sort of strange alien figure who seems to pull her out of the car. Um, and you're like, what, what the heck is, is going on? Towards the end of Celine's journey, when she's finally got all the crazy alien gear she needs to survive deep, deep in the underwater world, um, 
the you can see how <laughs> this is an echo of this car crash, right? It's literally like as if this world has created a place that would would bring back the sense of that trauma. Uh, and her final boss is is in this place. The first time you defeat it, the one where the credits roll, you get to see the same alien monstery looking figure that pulled the older lady from the car, right? Um, and then if you manage to collect all these pieces of the sun, defeat this boss that we're looking at, again, I'm gonna you know, show a little bit of this, this boss fight because it's bonkers. When we talk about bullet hell, this is, this is what we are referring to. <laughs> <laughs> it's, there's a lot going on in this. Fight. And I got to say real quick, I love this boss fight. It genuinely reminds me of um, one of my favorite boss fights of all time, which was Shinobi on the PlayStation 2, where mm. you do this boss fight and on some level you feel like the entire game has been a tutorial leading up to this fucking madness. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. and you and, and it's actually quite playable and, and beatable like the first time because of it, it it's just it's extra bullshit, but it's not bullshit that you haven't dealt with. So right. It, right. it all feels manageable and extremely intense. And uh, and part a, of what's so great fight. about it is they take the mechanics that they have so carefully taught you over the course of the game and they pretty much pull them all into this fight. There are rooms that are just trap avoidance rooms that teach you about the purple beams that this character is having to avoid. These little glowy orbs to the left and right of the character that, that you'll see or shoot every once in a while, allow you to see the, the red pustules that are, are the weak points of the boss. And you have learned to use these glowy orbs to show things that would otherwise not be in sight. And so it's all very intuitive, but if you hadn't played the rest of the game, it would just be complete nonsense bullshit. You'd never figure it out right for sure <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's so great about it it takes something that would absolutely be unbeatable for you and it teaches you how to do it um, yeah it almost feels like a like an in joke like if, if you're watching this and you're just like this looks like ridiculous nonsense it's because you haven't been taught by the game what it all means just yet and so that's right. that's one of the more satisfying types of boss encounters in my opinion yeah. is is not like uh yeah now, it's just it's now, good now it's it looks done. a little more astronaut like so it's, it also is like oh boy <laughs> oh boy it's it's like her uh subconscious nightmares are are manifesting uh and that's <laughs> part of what's great about this too is that there's such a a closeness between the story of what may or may not have happened to celine and what is going on on this alien planet where she's where she's stuck in, in yeah a cycle of endless rebirth um so the, the the ludo narrative like working together is real mm -hmm. tight in this game like yeah you feel like you're experiencing that frustration and confusion that right. celine herself clearly is going through yeah and we're i'm so used to ludo narrative dissonance in games where you like to think you're a good guy but you're just murdering millions of presumably <laughs> sentient people that it's quite a relief in some ways to have a game that is more aligned uh, with itself uh, in that way and yet still manages to have some really fun combat uh, so i want to zip past the fighting a bit we you, you get the idea uh, and this is the area that she comes to after defeating the boss that there there's a car down there the same way her house is bizarrely there so is her car and if you manage to get all the pieces of the sun together you get keys to that car and it's like you know <laughs> it makes no sense there's no logical uh defense for what the hell is going on um right. other other that that's the weird thing about this game is it still feels coherent as a sci-fi story on mm -hmm. some levels but it very clearly over time progressively tilts into something that is uh, cosmic horror and fantastical um, in a way that ought not be explained. Like it would, it would yeah. Yeah. feel, well, it wouldn't land the same. So if you have uh, subtitles on, you will know that this old looking creature in a chair is Celine's mother, Thea. 
right? And I kind of like the fact that she's made to look feminine by virtue of these tendrils and, yeah. and her, her bloated stomach that looks more like a pregnancy rather than just giving her boobs uh, on an otherwise <laughs> horrifying figure. <laughs> I mean, she's a skeleton. It would it would feel pretty she's weird. A, she's like a tree skeleton. It's so yeah. it's disturbing. Um, and the, Thea has clearly been here for quite some time uh, to have transformed into this thing. Uh, so there's I I have at least three possible explanations for what's happening. I'm gonna go through them real quick. I, I also uh, want to say very quickly that like if Hades was Daddy issues the game, this is Mommy issues the game. <laughs> I don't know, and and or self issues. There's a lot of yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on here, but you can see that she seems to have been magically transformed into the very astronaut that created the white shadow that caused the car crash in the first place. So okay, three ways this might be true. Number one, okay, Thea was a would be astronaut, or something happened that prevented her from going into space. Her daughter, our main character, Celine, uh, chased after the dream that was denied her mother and becomes an astronaut in real life herself. And uh, in so doing, she leaves behind her mother and her daughter who form a family with each other but have to live without her. Maybe she's experiencing some deep, deep grief and loneliness and guilt over the fact that she has left them behind. And then the more unexplainable bit is how the heck does she become this old school looking astronaut and then an alien takes her mom and brings her to this planet and then time is so messed up that somehow Celine crashes there after this has happened. It's all very strange, right? But theoretically, that could be one way that this happened, right? The car crash is Thea and Helios, who is Celine's child and Thea's grandchild. And Celine is the astronaut on the road. So that's one, the most likely, most plausible explanation. Okay, the, the second, plausible. plausible. The, the second most likely explanation, or you would probably call it the most plausible explanation is Selena's just crazy. She's in a nut house. She's imagining all this. She's processing through her grief. I don't think that's, no. Nah. Or nah, having lost one or, one or both members of her family in a car crash, and this is how she's dealing with it. Right, that's... That's another, and that would help to explain some of the weirdness that goes on in this game, right? The third explanation, the one I like the most, is that uh, there is some alien on this planet capable of manipulating time who has taken an interest in Selene. And here's why it's super implausible. This posits that Thea, Selene, and Helios are all effectively the same person, right? <laughs> <laughs> which does not really make sense. You have to get really into some bizarro uh, multiple timelines, parallel dimensions, time travel baloney in order to make this work. But it would explain why uh, Helios's memories and Celine's memories of being a child seem to be more or less the same. Uh, and why Thea seems so weary and tired of, of her life and of the child that she's parenting. Um, and it's has got such, at the same time, an expression of both fear of, with that car crash, but also as if she's almost expecting it to happen. There's the so I've got a altogether different one. Okay, good, go for it. Um, Celine, Celine's mom, Thea, yeah. wanted to be an astronaut, uh, chased it, didn't make it for whatever reason, was an absolute horror to her daughter, partly because of that yes. uh, unresolved uh, ambition. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, Celine is very much like put off and terrified by her mom, but still takes care of her. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect that it was a bad episode with Thea that led Celine to grab her daughter and leave their house, oh. which led to a car accident where she reached back to try to grab her daughter and save her daughter, but the mysterious tentacled force pulls her out of the car. She survives, 
after dealing with having just lost her daughter, decides to throw everything into just being an astronaut and leave it all behind, which some of the logs kind of Mm-hmm. like they're like they're like like some people are kind of like are you sure you're okay and you're just like yes this is easier for me than staying at home right and at, then, at one point it's clear that uh there's a midpoint in the game where celine does get to leave the planet and live the remainder of her life on earth in in right. her family home and then when she dies she's back on the planet again and some right. and then years later and then without without necessarily getting too deep into like the why, the reason that she was pulled out of the car and so on is because these are aliens that have some kind of timey abilities, force, whatever. But they pulled her in in order to become the creator slash destroyer that annihilates all of the, what do they call them? The fractured, no, not the fractured, like the, the weird ones that you fight that were very the clearly sentience. like, yeah, but the sentients yeah. are the general ones, and then there's like the ones that like, oh, seem I, like I'll... they were like social outcasts or something. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think this this entity from underwater that you meet at the very end of the game pulled her out of the car in order to put her on this path that leads to the planet, so that she could take care of all of these people that uh, all of these like residual people in the civilization that were problematic because that thing wants to like cleanse the world. And that's what you got pulled into and had very little say in. And that's terrifying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's my going theory. (laughs) Right. So something I haven't discussed as much is the planet itself. It seems to have a whole sentient race. uh, And they somehow share some kind of consciousness. But then this creator slash destroyer of their mythology, who is clearly Celine, Thea, or some combination of these things, um, causes a sort of fracturing in their society. And, and some of them are kicked out of the group consciousness. Uh, and the sort of revolutionary war takes place that, that decimates most of the population. By the time Celine gets there, there are relatively few of them left but she can see the uh, destroyed buildings that were erected in the past and many of the machines she comes across were presumably designed by this this alien race to help them survive this hostile planet Um, yeah and the and the part of the reason i think we might be in a bizarro video game where thea celine and helios are the same person is there's also this sense of the creator slash destroyer Uh, and of time looping in on itself. Uh, Right, you could be playing as a line of people, not a coherent person, like a a single person. Right, yeah. And it also like ties into, there's a lot of references to Greek mythology in this game. It's not quite clear how these references are supposed to work, but um, you know. I read that kind of as like the human understanding of what has occurred on the planet and like Mm -hmm. finding Mm-hmm. some kind of analogous mapping because right. it because it's accurate like by the yeah. end like yeah. of those yeah. logs you start reading and it's like okay yeah so i'm like killing all the gods and like where should i stop and this this whole kind of thing and it's like that mm-hmm. is a little bit what you're you're doing you're killing all these like all the bosses feel like they're um anchors of this culture that's essentially gone but that their presence can keep it alive in some way. And here you are like finishing it off. Yeah, it's pretty so. dark in that, in that way, for sure. Uh, this planet is mine now. It's the ultimate <laughs> gentrification of an alien world, right? Uh, <laughs> terrible. terrible. Yeah, the last it's shot of the genocide. game is just a Starbucks instead of your house. Oh no, it's awful, it's awful. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, if, if I'm uh, right about the underlying themes, they're riffing off of the old stereotype of the, the, three, the three women uh, archetypes, the maiden who is the young, the young available one, uh, the matron or mother uh, who is presumably coupled and has a child and has those maternal instincts, and then uh the crone or the old woman who can no longer have children whose own children are grown uh who's in the final stage of life and that's very much mm. represented by uh helio celine and and thea yeah right. and and i genuinely think that like there is no 
particular uh, sense in trying to find like a canonical answer here. Like this is really a, a, an open to it. Like I compared it to yeah. Lost before just so that people like get the analogous kind of like, you're not going to get all the answers sort of thing. Yeah. But this is in my yeah. mind more, in, not more interesting, more cohesive or like on purpose than right. Lost. Like well, certainly you're... the last the two seasons of Lost, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I mean that to say that I don't think the developers meant you to walk away from either the regular ending or the secret ending with like a coherent sense of what the fuck just happened. You're meant to really, yeah, yeah, whether it's yeah. those archetypes that you're talking about, like map them onto like your own archetypes of that and what it means to you. And like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of emotion going on yeah, for a game that yeah. I don't know what the fuck is happening 80% so, of the time. Right. Here, here's the thing. The even the secret ending feels very unfinished. It almost feels more unfinished than the original ending, which is kind of intriguing to me. But the very last shot is someone that gets out of the car and swims to the surface. And if you look closely, those look like a child's hands, not an adult's hands. So that oh, would yeah. indicate that Helios survives the crash. And then if I were to make a expansion slash sequel. I would have uh, Helios's attempt to rescue her mother and grandmother from this planet. That would be what I'd do. That would be interesting. I could see them putting out some kind of DLC update uh, for this game, free or paid, whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we talked a lot about the narrative and that's because it is unique among roguelikes in that way. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do briefly just want to say like, again, this, this gameplay loop is, is very good, but also very difficult. Uh, you yeah. shouldn't. This Don't is don't take it lightly. This one. <laughs> yeah, this is somewhere in like the Dark Souls world. Like, yeah. it's not exactly yeah. comparable because Dark Souls you're supposed to play extremely methodically and slowly. And in this game, if you're standing still, you're doing it wrong. So it's not a perfect mapping. But yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's it's not quite right to say that this game like needs a normal difficulty or an easy like mm -hmm. any difficulty at all just out the box it's very hard um but it mm -hmm. might be inaccessible to some people it's worth mentioning uh yeah i love yeah. it yeah i think uh like you were like right at the right place in your like learning of the controller yeah right? yeah since yeah. since you're like historically you know right. keyboard and mouse so, so for anybody who has never watched this podcast before, I grew up playing video games on computer or not at all, because after the Atari, I was simply not allowed to have any consoles growing up. <laughs> so uh, I give props to PlayStation for their controller being by far the easiest to use with small hands and all the feedback being super good. And this game is a great example of that. That's true. It's worth singling out that, that this is one of the first games to really use the controller features that can differentiate the experience from anything you know anything you're going to see without this without the right. dual sense the, the literally rain will create these little vibrations that you could even you you might not even notice until like you right. have that moment where you're like oh shit yes. <laughs> yes sound can come through your control and they use that in clever in clever ways uh, each gun feels a little different, so it just doesn't doesn't just sound different or do different stuff. But the controller it motion haptically feels different. Haptically feels different, uh, and the, your special ability for each gun has a cooldown. Uh, the controller makes a noise and a vibration every time that cooldown comes up, so you don't have to look at an indicator on the screen to know when it's available to you. Yeah, um, it's little things that you don't even realize you're automatically keying off of when you when you're in that flow state until like you you maybe have a reflective moment and you're like, wow, that's helpful. That's really great. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you can minimize the menu to very little and play this game without trouble, which is something I find I, I find pretty admirable. Yeah, so. I love UI minimalism. And so that was something I thought was really cool. Um, also, a quick shout out to like the the really thought through uh different options for um colorblindness because you mm -hmm. can do something that affects the entire hue of the actual game's uh world but you can also put on colorblindness modes for the interface uh and separately the pickups so that like i actually found it extremely useful to have a particular color blindness mode for for what I'm describing as like the the pickups, like the little basically the rays of light that come off things to tell you what type of thing they are, 
And so that those colors were slightly different from the actual object itself. Mm -hmm. And that would differentiate them so that I knew exactly what that thing was without actually having to um, read the text by right. like going up to it. So um, yeah. yeah, they really nailed some of that stuff, which I think you get when you partner with, with Sony, who's been doing some good work pushing accessibility stuff in yeah. most of their yeah. second party games. Yeah, and, and they did a good job of also taking advantage of some of the sound improvements that PlayStation's worked into their console. Uh, you notice it a lot more if you play the game on headphones. So I found myself using headphones even when I didn't didn't have to. Uh, I started doing it because if you were sleeping, I don't want to bother you. Uh, but I, I found that it was just like the three dimensional sense of sound would really give me a better idea where the enemies were shooting at me from. So it had actual, you know, gameplay advantages, but it also just sounds way better uh, that way. So good, good sound design. Uh, let me let me talk about the one bad part of design about this game. So um, roguelike games in general can suffer from the problem that while like on some level your game progress is saved because you've reached x point in the plot you're not going to go backwards in the plot right uh, each individual run takes you some amount of time and there may be no way to save during that run right and this is something other roguelike games have but your average roguelike game like hades is a good example where a run might be 30 to 40 minutes tops right so you have that much time in the day, you know you can set it aside, you're probably going to be fine, right? With Returnal, a, a single run could go through three biomes and take hours, worst case scenario. And now all of a sudden, I thought I had enough time for this game, but now I'm playing when I really wish I wasn't and it's late and I'm tired, but I'm playing anyway. That's not And great. it's hard to tell because on any given time you pick up the game, you might get killed in the first room and that just took you five minutes. And then you might suddenly find yourself on a really good run and not wanting to put it down, especially because of the strange choice of the save system. And I don't think that, um, I don't think that like the issue is any more complicated than they just aren't like auto saving at like loadable checkpoint type stuff the way that Hades mm -hmm. kind of has built into it with the room system in mm -hmm. that game. But, th but they could have done something analog in this where like every time you teleport or something, it could, it could be serving as a minor checkpoint so that you can fully turn off your, your console, switch to another game or whatever, and still resume that progress. Instead, they have this hard to understand system where if you put it in rest mode it'll save and then if you boot up the console and you switch to another game and you go back to returnal you you'll maybe be in that save that you were in before but you'll be back at helios i've had that happen and, oh, and it's, it's so confusing it's confusing because you're like yeah. i guess i'm on a fresh run and it's like wait why are all these rooms empty and why do i have consumables oh i guess i'm continuing a thing that i forgot about it's right yeah, a it's, bit odd. Yeah, I, I think they really needed to at least set up a, a soft save system where you would go back to the beginning of the last biome that you started, right? And maybe it will completely reconstruct that biome so it looks totally different. Whatever rooms you did, you have to do them over. Right, again. but that would at least give you an out. Right, that would at least give you an out that would probably give you a game time of an hour or less that would feel doable Perception, to people. Yeah. That would be a and big I will say, I will say to play devil's advocate that it does th this weird save system does lead into what I think is a defensible creative choice, which is this game doesn't actually have like a main menu. Like it really mm -hmm. is you press the button on the PlayStation to launch the game. And other than the couple splash screens of like, here's who developed it, um, it immediately just goes into like, the little quick cut montage of yes. Celine crashing and then her waking up and you're just in the game. And I do think that's a defensible choice, but it could have been um, uh, made a, a tad more understandable and sophisticated so that people just go back into the progress that they were in before. Right, and I gotta say, this does not feel like the choice of the game developer which is Housemark, mm. uh, known for their bullet hell style. This is the first game of theirs I've played, but from everything I have heard and read, 
it's not really their style to have done this. This is all Sony, and you can kind of tell. So. Yeah, because they've tried to do it with other games. It's like they want to, first of all, make rest mode the default for your PlayStation, so people don't turn it off. They put it in rest mode, and that allows them to apply operating system updates and game updates in the background, which I understand. But Returnal in particular is the worst example of what happens when you do that. So the very first big update for Returnal, uh, the goal was to make it possible for you to stumble across other players' bodies and then to stumble across yours. And you can scavenge that body for cool stuff, or you can call forth what killed them and try to avenge them, and it becomes a very difficult fight. And it, that was a great game mechanic and falls again on this uh, sense that uh, history is always repeating itself and yet it isn't pre-written necessarily. This kind of feeling like you almost are in a multiple universe version of your own world. Each, each player mm -hmm. has their own version of Celine. Uh, so it was clever and it fit the theme, but um, because I had the PlayStation in res mode, it applied that save in the background in such a way that it broke my save file until they put, uh, put in the next patch. So I actually wasn't able to play at all for several days without starting all the way over at the beginning. And if I had done that, I would have lost my progress permanently on my account. So Oof. that is what we do not want. PlayStation never <laughs> ever let that happen again. Uh, or whatever it is you're trying to do, it ain't going to work for you. Yeah, it's a it's, very, very strong reaction to people losing their progress on a very difficult game like that. Exactly. It's it's a little bit um, strange to because I can imagine Sony pushing for like this kind of thing where it's like, no, 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 let our our operating system like handle this stuff for you and rest mode will just be your save and so on. And as a developer, I can imagine them going great. The big boys have promised us that everything will be fine if we just follow their playbook and use their feature. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can shoot yourself in the foot like this. It's not like save files aren't something that developers are comfortable doing. Of course they are. They've been doing it forever. So, but they're it's used to doing it through a strange an partnership menu system yeah. and save files that you can select a file. And to be and clear, save that all takes work. Them. So, on some level, as a developer, it's like cool. We don't have to worry about that. That that could yeah. that could save us time and make us focus on our game. But it looks like there was a little bit of left hand not knowing what right hand's doing, and leads to this weird situation where they really back themselves into a nasty bug for a you know good couple of days there. Right. It also is a problem if you have multiple people who use the same PlayStation account and they would each like to have their own version of the game with their own progress, you can't. You would have to create a new profile and whatever you have purchased for the first profile, things like you know subscriptions would not be active on that other profile. So that's problematic. You need to be able to have multiple people in a household with their own save files. I know we we might want yeah. to not do it, but come on. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely some weird growing pains going on. I know like Sony is just starting to like ramp up and be very official about their second party presence and have this game and many others be PlayStation Studios and all this sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And to be clear, they still have, in my mind, the better roundup of exclusive titles including returnal um it's it's just a weird it's a weird misstep it, it, it's a little bit boggles the mind and so you know I, fortunately I be... that we're, we're past that as far right, as this game. Right. Like, it's been patched um, exactly and and, and, and i don't want to be too know about harsh it, about it saying mm -hmm. i have to take a few days off a game you're really not inconvenient inconveniencing. It's, <laughs> it's okay. But I, I do think that needed to be communicated better to people. There was no official announcement that I could see about what happened until after the other patch had been pushed through. Yeah, there's some there's some text here and there in the game where it's like, the way this works is you do the rest mode thing and so on. But that's not sufficient information. Like, it's normal for games that have novel save systems like roguelites Yes. To really like take a moment and and like make it very clear, like where's your save progress and what is right. saved and what's not saved and are you safe turning off and switching to another game and so on. Whereas this game, yeah. 
is a little bit too like it'll be fine when it hand wavy isn't it isn't yeah. necessarily fine yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and i and i want to make one more quick point about the idea of using rest mode as your only save um if if sony wants to do that they need to make it the default and i'm sorry if this is nitpicking but i don't care that the damn lights on the front of the box turn off on rest mode okay <laughs> because again there are scientific studies saying that if you're looking at bright light or bluish light and it's and it's late you may be preventing yourself from sleeping well but e either getting to sleep at all or having good sleep uh, yeah. so uh, there are people who sleep in the same room as their playstation this should not come as a huge shock to anybody who's lived in a new york city apartment right okay. yeah it's just your, your bedroom might be where you got your tv and everything right and especially and if you're living, sharing with roommates right exactly the the living room is where all your roommates are and if you don't want them to be mucking around on your personal console then it's probably in your room so uh rust mode i think already should be default those lights are turned off but especially yeah, if we're encouraging people to play that way then come uh -huh. on. yeah the um there's like a system setting for like making the light like go dimmer on the controller and there really needs to be one on the system too i don't think there is um I yeah it, it, and, and off should be an option <laughs> <laughs> always <laughs> always yeah because uh worst case scenario again i'm putting my little hardware uh knowledge in here what's going to happen is people are, are going to drape something over the box to make the light stop and now the venting that prevents the box from overheating no longer works so yeah. now when you apply that system update at two o'clock in the morning you risk hosing something in that machine oh. Not great. That's worst case scenario. If that ever <laughs> happens, I hope Sony will do the right thing and pay people back for their PlayStation 5s they destroyed. But considering it's still kind of hard to get them, even that's gonna <laughs> rub people the wrong way. Yeah, you know? that's fair. <laughs> so it's the little things. I don't wanna like over over hype it, but I've lived in no, the it's been, of, of, it's been of temple... electronics maintenance long enough to tell you that when you can yeah. patch a little thing, with a system right. update, you, you should. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's, it's the right game to actually go off on it because it is the tentpole PS5 game thus far. Uh, I mean, Ratchet and Clank just came out. That might have a stronger argument. I haven't played it yet, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it definitely uses the controller and the system features for good and bad. <laughs> right. Yep. So uh, we right. have spoiled the heck out of Returnal and explained why rest mode is the only save is is not my preferred methodology going forward, uh, and and even complained about the system lights on on the. <laughs> 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 I feel like we've done all the things that I wanted to do today. Uh, it's really good to be back, and hopefully we'll keep at it. But it is what it is. We all know how the pandemic's been and how weird it is trying to get back to normal life, such as it is. Um, but I hope we can continue bringing subjects to you that are interesting and informative and that you listen in. And I think that's where we'll leave it. This yep. has been Party Chat Peoples. We technically exist on socials, but we're back to the same jokes that we were early on. Where it's like, we technically have them, but they're pretty dead. <laughs> we'll see. We will revive them with the fervor of Atropos. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Bye.